So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're glad you joined us. Um, so this is the first time we're trying this uh, uh, online seminar. Uh, um, and uh, we have several groups joining here. We'll introduce them uh, in a minute. Um, speaker for this week is um, uh, Ona De Wolf from uh, CWI Amsterdam and the University of Amsterdam. Um, and so it seems uh, maybe to quickly go around the table, introduce the groups. He was here with the, with us in the Hangout. And as I said, there are also about um, you know, 20 others watching live stream. Um, um, they won't, we won't be able to see them, but they're here watching the um, talk live. So um, uh, I'll pass the microphone to um, Thomas, who's uh, one of the organizers. Uh, Thomas Vidik and uh, Anidia, they are organizing this um, together with me. So uh, Thomas, uh, you have the mic. Thanks, Oded. Um, pleasure to be here. And I'm very happy that we managed to fill our 10 spots. And it seems pretty stable. I'm talking to you from MIT. I'll just uh, introduce maybe each of the groups will just uh, say where they're from, and then we can start the talk. So we can do it in the order from left to right at the bottom of everyone's screen, starting from uh, Clément. So make sure you unmute yourselves and just say where you're from, and then we'll go around the table. So Clément, go ahead. Yeah, so this is uh, the group at Columbia. Uh, OK, thanks. Uh, uh, hi, I'm uh, Daniel Deduce. This is the group at uh, NYU. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, this is uh, MIT, Cambridge. Okay, guys, they're just next door for me. Oh, unmute yourself, Juan. Uh, sorry, we are the guys from Aspen like, Institute for Quantum Optics. Hi. Um, Thomas, do you want to say hi? Sure. OK. That's a group from ETH. Uh, the latest newcomer. I have to think. I'm sorry. I, I think the. The mic is on, but I don't know how to show it. So if we group at ETH, uh, hi. OK, thanks. One more group. I can see what the OK, welcome, guys. OK, you're dead. OK. <laughs> thanks, Thomas. So um, again, the idea would be to have uh, talks. Uh, currently, we're planning for once every two weeks. The first speaker, as I mentioned, is Ronald the Wolf. Uh, we have currently two other speakers lined up. In two weeks, uh, we'll have Anu Prao from University of Washington. Uh, again, Wednesday, probably same time. Um, we'll keep you updated. And uh, two weeks after that, it's March 6th, uh, Ragu Mekha from the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, so we'll try to maybe make it a bit earlier so people from Europe and Asia can uh, join in. Uh, OK, I guess that's probably all I had to say. Um, so the speaker for this first uh, TCS Plus seminar is um, Ronald De Wolf from CWI, University of Amsterdam. Ronald worked on um, quantum computing, uh, communication complexity, locally decodable codes. And today he'll tell us about recent work of his. Um, Ronald, please. OK, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, in case something goes wrong, just, uh, just interrupt me. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, let me let me start by saying that uh, I really think this uh, this TCS plus is a very exciting development uh, and I'm, I'm very happy and honored to be asked to give the first talk um, so this is a talk that's based on a joint work with Samuel Fiorini Serge Massar and Hans Raj Tibari from Brussels and Sebastian Pokuta from Erlangen who I think by now has moved to Georgia Tech uh, the title is exponential lower bounds for polytopes in combinatorial optimization and this this corresponds to a stock paper which has a different and more technical title. I think this title is actually, yeah, let's say, uh, more spot on. Um, so let's uh, get started with a bit of background. Um, and the background is the, the P versus NP problem. Of course, I'm not going to solve that problem, but I will say something interesting about it, I hope. Uh, more specifically, the background is the question whether it's possible to solve NP hard problems by means of efficient linear programs. So linear programming, uh, of course, this is one of the most famous problems uh, known to be in P, so for which we have efficient uh, polynomial time algorithms. This was first shown by Kachian in 79, um, such big news that it even made it to the New York Times. 
And such relatively easy problems should be contrasted with uh, hard problems. Uh, and a very famous NP hard problem is, of course, the, uh, the traveling salesman problem. So the idea of traveling salesman, as most of you probably know, is you're, you're given a graph on n vertices. The n vertices somehow represent cities. Uh, the edges uh, represent roads between cities. Uh, and they have weights, which you can think of as distances. And there's a, a salesman who wants to travel along all the cities. And he wants to do that in a, let's say, uh, the laziest way possible. So he wants to find a minimal, minimal tour that goes through every vertex exactly once. And this is, of course, the, this is the traveling salesman problem. And it's uh, one of the best known NPR problems. Now, of course, uh, given Katyan's algorithm, uh, if somebody were able to design a short polynomial sized linear program for this traveling salesman problem, he would actually show that P is equal to NP. Because you could just take that, that linear program and run Katyan's algorithm on it. And it would actually optimize. Uh, it would find an optimal traveling salesman tour for you. And of course, most of us, uh, including me, do not believe that p is equal to np. So by implication, we should not believe that there exists uh, an efficient polynomial size linear program for the TSP. Uh, some people beg to differ. And uh, there was a famous example of uh, Ted Sport, who uh, in 1986 uh, cl actually claimed to have found um, efficient polynomial size linear programs to solve TSP. Um, and I don't want to poo-poo what he did. I think what he did was pretty reasonable. And so in 1986, um, uh, this Katyan algorithm and its successors were still very new. So Swart did a very reasonable thing. He tried to apply the, uh, the strong, newly discovered algorithms to harder problems, such as NP-hard problems. Um, and he actually claimed to have found uh, a linear program of size roughly n to the 8. Uh, which was supposed to, to correspond to TSP somehow. And in fact, he wrote a technical report whose, whose title was P is equal to NP. Um, and then people were very, uh, let's say, excited for a while because the majority opinion, even in those days, was that P was different from NP. So there must be something wrong with Swartz's linear program. Um, and people actually find, found a bug in his program, but he fixed it, making it even bigger. So it went from n to the power 8 to size n to the power 10. Um, and this could have gone on for a long time until Yanakakis came along. And um, he actually showed that any symmetric linear program aiming to solve the traveling salesman problem must have an exponential number of, of linear constraints. So it must have exponential size. Um, so what does symmetric linear program mean? So I won't be too precise here, but you can think of it as, uh, as a linear program that treats all of the n cities symmetrically. Um, now, Swartz's linear programs, all of the ones that he proposed in his various tech reports, they were all symmetric. So Yanakakis' results definitively proved that the, uh, Swartz's approach, as well as any, let's say, modification that Swartz was trying, that just couldn't work. Any such linear program, if it were correct, it had to have an exponential number of constraints. And Swartz's LPs did not. So by implication, there must have been something wrong with them. Um, this left open the question, uh, what about, let's say, more general linear programs where you don't have this symmetry constraint? And this was a problem left open by Yanakakis, and it was open for a long time, more than 20 years. Uh, and you might think that this, these symmetry constraints, that they are sort of, um, they should really capture, if you have some sort of symmetric uh, combinatorial optimization problem, such as TSP, then really you would think that symmetric linear programs, they should be good enough. In other words, uh, morally speaking, a lower bound for symmetric LPs should also somehow give you a lower bound for general LPs. Um, however, there are some, some interesting combinatorial problems for which this is false. So uh, Kaibel et al. in 2010, um, they looked at um, uh, linear programs to find short uh, matchings, matchings of size about log n in graphs. And they showed that for this combinatorial optimization problem, actually, uh, allowing non-symmetry could make an enormous difference. So they showed that symmetric LPs for this matching problem had super polynomial size, while non-symmetric LPs could have polynomial size. So even in reasonable, sort of symmetric looking uh, combinatorial optimization problems, allowing non-symmetry helps a lot. And that means that Yanakakis' open problem really is an open problem. I mean, it, 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 it was conceivable until the result I'm presenting now. Uh, that there are actually non-symmetric linear programs, efficient ones for the traveling salesman. Of course, few people believe that because it would imply the implausible consequence that P is equal to NP, but nobody could prove it. 
Um, Yanakakis has a nice survey paper about these issues for the uh, the newsletter of the Mathematical um, Combinatorial Optimization Society written in May 2011 and he ends this survey by saying um, I believe in fact that it should be possible to prove that there is no polynomial size formulation for the TSP polytope or any other NPR problem although of course showing this remains a challenging task uh, and this is exactly what we show and it's exactly what I'll try to present in the uh, in this talk um, so why am I talking about polytopes here why is Yanakakis talking about polytopes well this should become clear soon um, as I go into more technical issues so let's talk about uh, about polytopes briefly I, I guess most people here know what a polytope is there's really two ways two equivalent ways to look at a polytope on one hand you can say that um, you can just take a bunch of points so look at this picture for instance you can take these eight corner points and then you can take the convex hull of these points uh, so let's say in in the picture this would be in R2 in general it could be in R2 to D so the convex hull of these of this finite set of points uh, forms a polytope and an equivalent way to define the same polytope is by describing the uh, the facets of the polytope so these are sort of the tightest half spaces or linear constraints that you can use to to describe the same region right so in this case these 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 corner facets here there's eight of them they also describe the same polytope and this this dual representation either as the convex hull of points or as the intersection of a bunch of linear inequalities this this, this duality will reappear will reappear many times in this talk um, of course this facet representation can be written as a system of linear inequalities so you can define the polytope just as the set of d-dimensional vectors x uh, solve that are solutions for this system of linear inequalities right so a would be a matrix here um, its number of columns would be equal to d the dimension of, of x and its number of, uh, of rows would be equal to however many linear constraints you use to describe your polytope um, and it's important to note here and this is a fact that we will use later that there is a certain plasticity a certain let's say flexibility about this this representation of, of the polytope as a system of linear inequalities uh, so different systems of linear inequalities can define the same polytope a very trivial example is you could take such a system of linear inequalities you could multiply both a and b by let's say the number 10 and you would be describing exactly the same polytope uh, and less trivially you could also uh, let's say just add some extra redundant linear inequalities uh, to get somehow a larger system of inequalities that still describes the same polytope so redundancy is allowed and as we will see later it can actually be useful um, and an important measure let's say complexity measure of uh, a polytope is its size which is the the minimal number of inequalities that you need in such a system right so some systems are redundant others are not and the size of P is the minimal number of inequalities that you that you really need to use uh, after weeding out all the redundancy um, and for let's say in, in general for the purposes of this talk this is actually the same as the number of facets of the polytope so for this picture here my uh, regular 8 gone there's 8 facets that are needed to describe this polytope so the size here is 8 um, and let's say the most important specific polytope for the purposes of this talk is the TSP polytope um, okay so here we're going to be a little bit technical but not terribly so I think so the TSP polytope is defined as the uh, the convex hull of all the Hamiltonian cycles in the complete graph kn on, on n vertices right so you can look at the, the complete graph kn uh, undirected graph and you can look at all of the tours the, the Hamiltonian cycles in this graph now each of those is just a set of edges and it has a characteristic vector so each each subset of the edges F which forms a tour in KN you can associate with that its characteristic vector which is just a boolean vector in n choose two dimensions right so this vector would just say which edges are or are not present in in F um, so this is a way to write a specific Hamiltonian cycle as a vector and now you can take the convex hull of all of these vectors and that's the TSP polytope so this is some geometric object in uh, in uh, real space and choose two dimensions why do we care about it well we care about it because if we could optimize a linear function over this polytope we would be in in business because the TSP problem just asks about lin optimizing in particular minimizing the following linear function 
over this polytope, right? So suppose somebody gives us the weights, W, I, J. You can think of that as the distance between city I and city J. Um, then what TSP just asks is to minimize this linear function here, so the sum over all I, J of the weights, so the distance between I, J times X, I, J, over all the elements of the polytope. Uh, and why does this give us the, the minimal length Hamiltonian cycle? Well, the reason is that if you minimize a linear function over a polytope, uh, its minimum will actually be achieved at the vertex. And, and the vertices of this polytope are exactly, by definition, they are the, uh, the Hamiltonian cycles. So the minimal of this linear function over this polytope is actually the minimal length of any Hamiltonian cycle um, according to this weight function. Um, unfortunately, this polytope uh, itself has an exponential size, so you can write this thing down as a linear program, but you're going to need an exponential number of constraints, right? And no matter how fast uh, car markers or Kachian's algorithms are, uh, they won't run efficiently if, they're, if the linear program that they're trying to solve is actually exponentially large. So this seems like bad news for, let's say, LP approaches for solving TSP. If you just try to, to characterize this TSP polytope using linear constraints, you're going to need an exponential number of those linear constraints. So that's, that's pretty bad. Um, of course, this is something that, that people knew all along. It's also something that uh, Swartz already knew when he did his, uh, his attempt at an efficient LP. So there's a trick. And the trick is to use uh, extended formulations. Uh, so the idea of, of extended formulations of polytopes is that you can somehow add a small number of additional variables, so increase the dimension of your polytope a little bit, uh, write some new constraints that also use these auxiliary variables, and sometimes uh, the size of the, the resulting polytope actually drops enormously. Um, and I think a picture uh, says more than a thousand words here, so uh, let's first look at this picture here. It's a very nice picture. You can see at the bottom, so projected in R2, there is actually the regular 8 gone that I had uh, on the previous slide, which we already observed that it has size 8. However, above it, so hovering above it, there is a three-dimensional polytope, so the region inside this sort of funny box. Um, and as you can see, if you just drop uh, one of the three coordinates, so if you just project down to the first two coordinates, this picture actually becomes the regular 8 gone. Uh, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the number of facets of this three-dimensional polytope, it's actually less than what we had before. This thing has only six facets. There, there are six sort of planes that, uh, that border it. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. If you count it correctly, there are six of them. And yet, if we project it down to two dimensions, you get something that has size 8. Um, and going down from size 8 to size 6 is not terribly impressive, but you can generalize this to the reg regular n gone. And then it actually turns out that this thing by itself has size n, if you just view it as a two-dimensional polytope. But it's actually the projection of a polytope in dimension order log n of size order log n. So by going from 2 to roughly log n dimensions, adding a small number of auxiliary dimensions, uh, you can actually obtain your complex polytope as the projection of a much simpler polytope, right? So somehow, by adding log n extra variables, you manage to reduce the size exponentially. You go down from n to roughly log n, right? So this picture is not some fluke. It, it generalizes nicely to, uh, to, to regular n gons instead of just a regular 8 gon. Um, and of course, it would be great if we could do the same for, let's say, interesting combinatorial problems. So combinatorial problems that correspond to, um, uh, let's say, to optimizations over a polytope that has a large size by itself, but that actually has a very efficient extension. Um, and, and these things exist. So uh, there are some very nice examples. For instance, if you look at the, the convex hull of all the minimum spanning trees in a graph, um, uh, this is actually something, this polytope has exponential size, but it has, uh, you can obtain it as a projection of, a, of another polytope in slightly higher dimension that has size only n cubed. So there are, let's say, real-world examples, even in combinatorial optimization, where this trick of going to extended formulations really saves you enormously. Um, so let's be a bit more precise about, about what an extended formulation of a polytope P is. Uh, it's basically just another polytope, so think of P as a d-dimensional polytope, then 
an extended formulation of P will be some polytope in larger dimensions, so you add K dimensions, think of K as not too big, in such a way that if you project away these extra variables again, you get back the original polytope P. Right, so P would be exactly the set of X's such that there exists a Y in K dimensions where the, the XY pair is in the bigger polytope Q. And then, of course, uh, our goal is to, let's say, look at this trade-off. How much can we, can we reduce the size of P by going to extended formulations? Um, and the more we gain there, the better, we, uh, the better uh, let's say, algorithms we get. Because if you want to optimize some linear function over P, you could also equally well optimize the same function over Q, because Q is an extension of P. So if you somehow manage to get a Q that has very small size, you get a small, efficient linear program for doing your optimization problem. And how small can the size be? Well, this, of course, depends on what the initial polytope P was. Uh, so in general, we'll define the, uh, the extension complexity of a polytope P to be the lowest size you can obtain. So you minimize the size of Q among all the, the Qs, so the bigger polytopes that are extended formulations of P. Um, and this, this is, let's say, this is probably the most important uh, definition in the whole talk, the, uh, the extension complexity of a polytope P. Um, are people still listening, by the way? Maybe now would be a good time to break for a question, if somebody wants to ask a question. Do people hear me? Yes, we have one question from uh, NYU, yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We're definitely listening. Daniel, unmute. Sorry, I wasn't going to ask a, a question. No, uh, maybe just a, a comment that maybe it's worth saying that uh, even though the extension complexity of a polytope you know, may, may be large, it still doesn't say anything about the fact that you can't separate over this, this polytope. So the, the notions of complexity that we're looking at here are kind of limited in just counting the number of inequalities that you need. That's certainly true, yeah, that's certainly true. So uh, I guess there's basically two different ways to uh, to uh, to solve linear programs. There's the um, the ellipsoid method, uh, which I guess that's the one that only requires a separation oracle. Unfortunately, apparently it's not very useful in practice because it's too slow. And then there's the interior point algorithms that are faster in practice, but for those apparently you actually do have to list all of the linear constraints, so all of the facets of the polytope. Um, it is true that uh, we're not, let's say, we're not going to, to prove a very general result here, that there is no linear programming approach to any combinatorial problem. So the kind of lower bounds we'll be proving will be for linear programs that optimize some function over an extended formulation of a fixed polytope. Uh, and we'll be focusing here on the case where the polytope corresponds to the TSP problem. Um, which brings me to the next slide, which is, uh, let's say, let me state the main result that we're going to prove and also, uh, let's say, emphasize what it does and does not prove. Uh, so our goal will be to prove strong lower bounds on this extension complexity for interesting polytopes. And when I say interesting, let's say the canonical example would be the TSP polytope, but we will also see a few other, let's say, polytopes in this talk that are also interesting for combinatorial optimization. So this just repeats the definition of the TSP polytope. Remember the TSP polytope is the, the convex hull of all the Hamiltonian cycles in the complete graph. Um, if we could somehow characterize this by a small number of linear constraints, that would be great because it would give an efficient linear program for TSP. Uh, our main result is that this is not possible. So the, the extension complexity of the TSP polytope is at least two to the root n. Remember, n is the number of, of cities in the graph, the number of vertices in the graph. Um, so this is a strong lower bound on, uh, on a certain kind of linear program solving TSP. So if you want to design a linear program um, that just characterizes a TSP polytope in some way and then optimizes a linear function over that, uh, that is, uh, and any such ca characterization is going to need a very large number of constraints, so very super polynomial number of constraints. Um, right, so every linear program for TSP that's based on extended formulations needs exponential time. Um, now, you might, let's say, unfairly summarize this, this result as saying that we show that linear programs for TSP need to have exponential size. Uh, this, of course, will be a gross overstatement of what we're actually doing here. We're really only lower bounding 
uh, lower bounding the size of a specific type of linear programs for TSP, as I said, namely the ones based on extended formulations of the TSP polytope. Uh, going much beyond that would be uh, extremely hard. I mean, uh, linear programming is known to be a p-complete problem, so if you could somehow show that any linear program, no matter what form for TSP, requires super polynomial size, you would have separated p from, from np. Um, and I, I don't think uh, this is a result. I think this is a result which is not really uh, in sight at the moment. So this result is what it is. It, it doesn't show that all linear programs for TSP fill, but it does show that a large class of, of linear programs for TSP fill, where fill in this sense means that they have to be exponentially large. Uh, uh, and in particular, the, the approaches of... Question? Yeah, there's actually a question from uh, Suresh. Suresh. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So one question I had with the definition of the extended formulation was that you define the complexity in terms of, again, the number of facets, right? That's right. And um, you don't really care about the dimension of the space you lift it into in order to get these small number of facets. So I guess my question is, is there some good intuition as to why we don't really care about the number of extra variables we add? We only care about the facets. Uh, I think without loss of generality, the number of extra variables will not be bigger than the number of facets. If it's uh, bigger, that, you can true. somehow reformulate it by just sort of uh, removing some of the variables. No, that's true. But I guess, is there any interesting question that arises if you want to, you know, have a small higher dimensional representation? Like, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, some of these recent uh, non-negative matrix factorization results try to get a very few variables when they do the, when they, when they sort of intuitively lift in some sense. And so, um, is there, is there any sort of separate interest in, in that, in, in, in minimizing the number of variables are uh, not really. There's no real problem where this comes up, where it is an issue. Um, I would imagine that there's probably mathematicians that are very interested in keeping the dimension low. Um, okay. I'm not an expert in this. Um, but it's, it's certainly a very reasonable question. So uh, if nobody has studied this before, I, I would suggest somebody in the audience to take this up quickly because it looks like a very <laughs> natural question. Uh, Thanks a lot. This, uh, may, which, this reminds me that there's another thing that I uh, should uh, clarify here. So we define the size of, um, of a linear program just as the number of facets, so the number of linear constraints in the LP. Now, if you would like to have, let's say, a really reasonable definition, you should also take into account the, the number of bits needed to write down the coefficients. Um, however, for our purposes, that doesn't really matter because we care about proving lower bounds and what we're going to do is we're just going to lower bound the number of facets. So we don't even, even if the, let's say, number of bits needed for the coefficients is tiny, a lower bound on the number of constraints, uh, so a lower bound on the size is, is a lower bound. Um, if you would care about upper bounds, of course, you would also have to care about the, uh, let's say, how many bits are needed to represent the coefficients in your extended formulation. But for us, since we only care about lower bounds, or we mostly care about lower bounds, that doesn't really matter. Okay, so that brings me back to the statement of the, uh, the main result. Uh, and the upshot of this is this rules out a lot of potential algorithms. So anything sort of uh, a la SWART uh, is killed by this approach, um, as well as a large number of other approaches. So uh, there's a very nice web page by Gerhard Wöginger, who um, has collected uh, all of the P versus NP approaches that have, have, have come around uh, over the years. And many of those are of the form that somehow tries to, some, somebody tries to write down an efficient linear program for something like TSP or MaxCut or something like that. Um, and all of those approaches are, are ruled out by, by this, this result here. They were already ruled out for symmetric linear programs by Yanakakis, but we now rule them out for even the non-symmetric ones. Um, and here's a roadmap of the proof. Um, so the main proof will actually be not about the TSP polytope, but about uh, an easier to analyze polytope that's called the correlation polytope. And for this one, we can actually prove a very tight lower bound on its extension complexity, uh, namely 2 to the n, which is essentially optimal. Um, and what's interesting, at least to me, is that, that this result here is inspired by a result in quantum communication complexity. Um, so I have two versions of this talk, one that emphasizes the quantum aspects and one that de-emphasizes the quantum aspects. Uh, I guess for this audience, I'm doing the one that de-emphasizes the quantum aspects. Uh, but I think it's interesting to note that while the proof that I'm going to give doesn't need any quantum communication results, uh, we wouldn't have found it without those results. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that as it is. So, so this is essentially a classical talk, but I do want to point out that its inspiration came from an earlier quantum communication result. 
Um, and once we have this result for the uh, the correlation polytope, um, there's a classical reduction basically just playing around with gadgets and graphs that that's that shows that from a lower bound to the correlation polytope, you can also get a weaker lower bound for the TSP polytope. Uh, and the intuition there is that you can somehow embed the TSP polytope in the correlation polytope, right? So a lower bound for, uh, sorry, you can embed the correlation polytope in the TSP polytope. So a lower bound for correlation polytope gives the lower bound for TSP polytope. Uh, and I'll spend one slide on this reduction, but I think it's the, the less interesting part of the uh, the less interesting part of this talk, so I'm going to focus on, on this result here, lower bounding the, uh, the extension complexity of the correlation polytope. Of course, I haven't defined yet what the correlation polytope is, but you'll see it in a moment. Um, okay, so our goal here is to prove strong lower bounds on extension complexity, and fortunately for us, uh, Yanakakis in his paper already developed some very nice machinery that allows us to do this. Uh, he didn't use that machinery himself for his lower bounds on symmetric LPs, for, which is a little bit strange, but he developed the machinery nonetheless, and we'll be, we, we gratefully use it here. Um, and the connections that he made uh, uh, involve uh, a matrix that's called the slack matrix. So let me explain that first. So suppose we have some polytope P, which, as I said before, you can characterize in two ways. You can either give a set, set of points V and take its convex hull, this set V has to include all of the vertices of the polytope, but it might also include other points. So you take the convex hull and you get the polytope. And equivalently, you can characterize the same polytope by giving a system of linear inequalities. Right? So some matrix system AX less than B, uh, which I can also write as a set of linear constraints. So AI would be the, the ith row of the matrix A, and BI would be the ith element of the vector B. Um, so what is this idea of a slack matrix? Well, the idea of a slack matrix is that you, you somehow write down, for every pair of an equality with a point in V, you write down uh, the slack that this point has with respect to this constraint. Right? So all of these, these points in V, they are elements of the polytope, so they must satisfy this constraint. And that means that the right-hand side minus the left-hand side uh, is at least zero. Right? If the equality so if x is a point in V and it meets this, this inequality with equality, then the slack will be zero. The right-hand side minus the left-hand side will be zero. Uh, and if the inequality is, is sort of, if there's some slack, if, there's a, if, if bi is strictly greater than the left-hand side, uh, then there will be positive slack. So in general, um, we'll define a matrix S. Uh, the slack matrix of this polytope, uh, its rows will be indexed by indices i corresponding to constraints. And its columns will be indexed by integers j corresponding to, to elements of the, the point set v. Um, and the sij entry of the slack matrix is just the slack of the point vj with respect to the ith constraint. So the right-hand side of that constraint minus the left-hand side of this constraint. Um, and every entry is non-negative, as I said before, because every vj is in the polytope, therefore it has to satisfy these inequalities, either with equality or, or with some positive slack. Uh, and another thing to observe, and this is the same flexibility that I mentioned before, is that S is not uniquely induced by the polytope, because it also depends on which particular uh, linear inequalities you choose, right? So there's some, some sort of freedom that you have here, and that also affects uh, the entries of the slack matrix. So I will sometimes loosely speak about the slack matrix of a polytope, but you should really keep in mind that uh, a slack matrix, the specific slack matrix, really depends on the, the set of inequalities that we use and the set of uh, points V that we use to characterize the polytope. And there's some freedom there that we will exploit. Um, and this slack matrix S, it, since it has only non-negative entries, you can somehow factor it um, as a sum of, of rank one matrix, sum of non-negative rank one matrices. So I guess I have no way to blot this out, but if you forget this greater or equal to zero constraint for the moment, then what we have here characterizes the, the usual rank over the reals of the matrix S. So the rank over the reals uh, is just the minimal number R such, such that you can write S as a sum of such rank one matrices, right? If AJ and BJ are vectors, then the outer product AJ, BJ transpose is a rank one matrix. And the minimal number R such that you can write S as a sum of R of these things, that's just a rank of the matrix S. 
Um, and if you now add to these vectors the constraint that their entries have to be non-negative, um, then you get something that's called the uh, non-negative rank. Right, so the non-negative rank is the minimal R that you need to write down such a such a positive factorization of the matrix S. So every matrix S that has no negative entries has a, has some non-negative rank. Uh, in some cases, this non-negative rank can be much much bigger than the rank. Of course, it's always lower bounded by the rank because this is just like the definition of the rank, but with an extra constraint. Um, and this, this notion of non-negative rank of the select matrix is, is, is crucial for determining the extension complexity of a polytope because Yanakakis proved the following wonderful equality in his paper. Um, he proved that the extension complexity of the polytope P is actually equal to the non-negative rank of its select matrix. Um, and this is very nice because what it means is uh, it, re it reduces a very complicated question. So if you look at the left-hand side of this equality, this asks about the extension complexity of P, which is really a question about all possible uh, extensions of P. So all possible other polytopes Q that somehow project back to P, right? So this is sort of, this is minimizing something over an infinitely large set of Qs. The right-hand side, on the other hand, is a very concrete notion. You can just write down a specific select matrix for the polytope P itself. It doesn't depend on any extensions. This matrix is going to have a certain non-negative rank and that number will be exactly the extension complexity of the polytope. Uh, I find this equality very surprising. It's not super hard to prove. So the, let's say the most technical thing that going ingredient going into it is the, the Farkash lemma. Uh, so the idea that uh, a convex set uh, is separated from any point outside of it by a hyperplane. So I want to find, I uh, want, uh, let's say, prove this equality here, but I want to emphasize one, that it's very important, two, that it's quite surprising, and three, that it's not very hard to prove. Um, right, and now in the interest of making our question even easier, we have already reduced the question from extension complexity to a question about rank, and now we're going to lower bound rank by something very combinatorial that we as theoretical computer scientists know how to analyze. Um, so what Yanakakis also showed is that this non-negative rank of the matrix S is actually lower bounded by the following uh, combinatorial quantity. Um, so I hope everybody knows what the, what a rectangle is in a matrix. It's essentially just um, uh, like a Cartesian product between a set of rows and a set of columns. So it picks out, like say, it picks out, well, as, as the name says, it pick, picks out a rectangle in the matrix. Um, and the non-negative rank of the matrix S is lower bounded by the minimal number of rectangles that you need to cover all the non-zero entries of S and no zero entries of S. In other words, you can look at the support of the matrix S, so the set of its entries uh, where S has a non-zero entry, so where there's some positive slack, um, and you can try to cover that support using rectangles. Um, if the matrix is very complicated, if it has a very complicated pattern of zeros and non-zeros, you probably need a large number of rectangles. Um, and what Yanakakis showed is that this minimal number of rectangles uh, is actually a lower bound on the non-negative rank of the matrix S. Uh, and it's not so hard to see why this is the case. So let's look back at the definition of the positive factorization of S. So suppose that R is minimal here. Um, so it's easy to see that that's, let, let's look at one of these rank one matrices here in this, in this decomposition. So AJ is a matrix of non-negative entries, and BJ is a matrix of non-negative entries. Um, if you just take the rectangle corresponding to the rows where AJ is non-zero and the columns where BJ is non-zero, then the resulting rectangle will exactly cover a rectangle of non-zero entries in the matrix. So there's a very clear correspondence between such a rank one non-negative matrix and a rectangle that covers part of the support of the matrix. Um, and therefore, if you have a positive factorization of rank R, this actually induces a rectangle covering uh, of the support of S with R rectangles. Yeah, there might be other rectangle coverings, but every positive factorization induces one, and that gives you this lower bound here. Um, and for those of you familiar with communication complexity, this, this combinatorial measure here this should remind you of non-deterministic communication complexity. And non-deterministic communication complexity is something we actually know a lot about. Um, so that brings me to um, to the next slide, the con connection with communication complexity. Um, so 
uh, let me let me talk a little bit about uh, a result that I proved a long time ago, which showed an exponential separation of quantum and classical non-deterministic communication complexity. And it doesn't really matter what that is. I think this, this paper is a bit of an esoteric paper, but the, the most important thing for the purposes of this talk is that to get this old result, uh, I defined this, this matrix here, 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix M. Uh, its rows are, are indexed by n bit strings A, and its columns are indexed by n bit strings B. And the AB entry of the matrix is just defined as this number here. So you look at the inner product between the, the n-dimensional vector A and the n-dimensional vector B. Uh, you, you take the inner product, you take 1 minus the inner product, and you square it. Um, what is this inner product here? Well, remember A and B are n-bit strings, so really what this inner product measures is the number of indices i where both ai and bi are 1. Um, and if you think of A and B as the characteristic vectors of sets, then what is being measured here is actually the intersection size between the two sets. Right? And this should remind you of the, one of the core problems of communication complexity, namely the disjointness problem, which asks whether uh, Alice's set and Bob's set are disjoint or not. Okay, so this is just a definition of this matrix, and this matrix is going to give us everything that we want, uh, with relatively little effort, because most of the work has been done by other people, namely Yanakakis and uh, Sasha Rasborov. Um, so what, what can we prove about this matrix? So, so I'll, I'll prove, first prove some properties about this matrix, and then I'll translate this back to polytopes. Um, so I claim the following. If you, if you look at this matrix here, um, so remember the matrix entry at AB is 1 minus the intersection size squared. Um, so if you look at this, this matrix here and its support, so this is going to be non-zero uh, exactly when the intersection between A and B is not equal to 1. So there's going to be a positive entry here when A and B are disjoint, and there's going to be a positive entry here when A and B intersect in more than one point. So there's some sort of complicated pattern of zeros and non-zeros in this matrix. Its support has a fairly complicated structure. And you would expect that you, you're going to need a large number of rectangles to cover that support. And this is indeed true. So what we're going to prove now is um, that if you want to cover the support of this matrix here, this 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, then you're going to need a very large number of rectangles, namely 2 to the omega m of them. Um, and this, of course, by the previous slide, is going to give us a lower bound on the non-negative rank of this matrix M. Uh, so let's see where this claim comes from. Well, as I said, other people have done the work for us. In this case, it's Rosborov. So in his, his paper analyzing the, uh, the communication complexity of the disjointness problem, uh, the core thing that Rosborov proves is the following. Um, so there exists a measure mu, uh, a distribution on, on AB pairs. Uh, which puts weight one-half on the set of disjoint AB pairs and weights one-half on the set of pairs AB that intersect in exactly one point. Right, so the disjoint inputs get half of the weight, the intersection one inputs get half of the weight, and then Rosborov shows that there exist constants alpha and delta such that for every rectangle R, um, if you look at that rectangle R and you intersect it with B, so the ones where there's a unique intersection, uh, then the weight of that set is lower bounded by, essentially by the weight of the intersection of the same R with the set A, uh, minus a little bit. So the, the intuition here is if you have a rectangle uh, which contains, uh, let's say, a fair number of elements from A, so a fair number of disjoint elements, uh, then either that rectangle is very small or it also contains a fair number of AB pairs that intersect in size 1. Um, and we're only going to use this in a very special case. So, so let's look at, at a specific rectangle that covers uh, some elements in the support of this matrix. Then this rectangle R is not allowed to have any element from B, right? Because the elements of B correspond to, uh, to A, B pairs of intersection size 1, but those correspond to zeros in this matrix. And a rectangle R is supposed to cover only parts of the support of M, so only non-zero entries. So if we have a rectangle R that covers uh, only support entries of the matrix, then its intersection with B should be zero. Uh, if you plug that into this inequality that Rasborov proved, that implies that the intersection of R with the set A must actually be exponentially small. right? And now if you would like to cover everything in A, 
Remember, everything in, in A here corresponds to a non-zero entry in M, so you need to cover that. Uh, just to cover the elements in A, uh, you're going to have to use very many, very small rectangles. Um, so it follows from this that, that you really need 2 to the n, 2 to the omega n rectangles just to cover the elements of A. Um, so certainly anything that covers the whole support of M uh, is going to need a, an exponential number of rectangles. Um, and this, this, this proof, proves this claim. And going back to the previous slide, this means that um, the non-negative rank of this matrix M, uh, remember the previous slide claims that this quantity is lower bounded by the number of rectangles needed, that this non-negative rank is indeed at least 2 to the omega n. It's exponentially large. So what we have here is a matrix with a very simple structure. Um, in fact, you can easily see that its rank is at most n squared, because you can write this out in roughly n as a sum of roughly n squared rank 1 matrices, but its non-negative rank actually has to be exponentially large. Um, and this is very good, because uh, lower bounds on non-negative rank mean lower bounds on extension complexity, um, if this matrix M were the slack matrix of a polytope, um, which it's not. So we'll now have to do a trick that we somehow massage this M into a submatrix of a specific slack matrix. And that's what I'll do on the next slide. Yeah, so this slide is, is probably the most important slide in the whole talk. This is the, the lower bound for the correlation polytope. I still haven't defined the correlation polytope for you, so let me do that now. Um, it's the following polytope. Um, so its entries, you can either view its entries as, as n by n matrices, or you can view its entries as n squared dimensional vectors. So the, the, let's say the dimension of, the, of this polytope is n squared, but it's convenient to, to view each element of it as an n by n matrix. Um, and the way it's defined is you take uh, every n bit string B, you take the outer product of that, so this gives you a rank 1 Boolean matrix, and now you just take the convex hull of all of these 2 to the n matrices. So this gives you some, some polytope, an interesting polytope. For instance, you can write the, uh, the clique problem directly as, as optimizing a linear function over this polytope, but I won't talk about that further. Um, the important thing for us is that there's a whole bunch of constraints that hold for this correlation polytope, and here's 2 to the n constraints that hold for it. So this looks a little bit technical, but I claim that the following linear constraint is valid for the correlation polytope, and there's one such constraint for every n-bit string A. So what is this constraint? Well, let's fix one specific n-bit string A and define the following matrix. So you take the matrix which has uh, as which has twice the entry, which is defined as twice the diagonal matrix that has the entries of A on its diagonal, minus the outer product of A with itself. Uh, so what is this matrix here? Well, if you look at its diagonal, the, the entries on its diagonal will just be A. Uh, and the off-diagonal entries will either be 0 or they will be minus 1. <coughs> and they will be minus 1 exactly at an entry ij, where both ai and aj are 1. That's actually the reason that this thing is called the correlation polytope. Um, so this is a fixed matrix depending on A. Um, if you take the trace of this fixed matrix with any element x of the correlation polytope, this is a linear function of the entries of x. And what our constraint says just is that this linear function of the entries of x has to be at most 1. Okay, so for every n-bit string A, we get such a constraint. I haven't proven to you that these are valid constraints, but I'll do so in a moment. Um, so the constraint is just that this specific sum of the entries of x, so this is a linear constraint on the n-squared entries of x, that this linear, linear expression has to be at most 1. Uh, let's see that this is actually valid so that, that every point in the correlation polytope satisfies this inequality. Um, and one way to do that is just to calculate the slack um, of this constraint with respect to any vertex and show that it's non-negative, uh, which is what we'll do now. So remember the way the slack was defined. You take the constraint, you put in the point that you care about, which in this case is B, B transpose, so one of the vertices of the correlation polytope, and then you take the right-hand side minus the left-hand side, and that's the slack of this vertex with respect to this constraint. So what is that? So SAB, the uh, the AB entry of the slack matrix S, so remember A stands for a constraint, B stands for one of the vertices, 
it's the right hand side minus the left hand side so one minus this complicated trace inner product uh, and if you massage this a little bit it turns out to be equal to this number here which is non-negative so because it's a square so this already proves that indeed the uh, these these linear constraints are valid for the whole correlation polytope but what's more is that these slacks are actually equal to the entries of the matrix MAB that we had on the previous slide so this is very nice I mean what we've done here is we've identified a bunch of constraints that are valid for the correlation polytope uh, and we've calculated the slacks of these uh, constraints for the vertices of the polytope and they turn out to be exactly the matrix entries of the matrix we have already analyzed before so that means that we can now make up a slack matrix for the correlation polytope part of which will be our matrix M so let's just define a slack matrix S for the correlation polytope um, and the first two to the N constraints so the first two to the N rows of our slack matrix will correspond to these two to the N linear inequalities which are all valid for the uh, for the correlation polytope and the 2 to the n columns they will just correspond to the 2 to the n vertices so each column here is labeled by a b or actually by a b b transpose um, and the slacks for constraint a with respect to point b is just the matrix entry m a b uh, and of course this might not be a complete characterization of the polytope let's say these this first two to the end constraints it's not at all clear that they characterize the complete correlation polytope so we might have to add some further constraints some further rows to the select matrix so that all the facets are included right so the select matrix that we're ending up with its first two to the end by two to the end block is just our familiar matrix m and then below that there's a whole bunch of other constraints that we don't really care about but that are necessary to to completely characterize the P the polytope the correlation polytope in other words uh, all the facets should be included here so the facets that are not yet among the two to the n constraints that we care about we'll just add them in further rows and we won't really care about this piece of the matrix anyway uh, and now comes the most important line of the most important slide um, because now we're basically done let's see what we get for the correlation polytope well remember we care about its extension complexity so uh, let's say the minimal size of any extension so any polytope that projects back to the correlation polytope thanks to Yanakakis we know that this is equal to the non-negative rank of a slack matrix in particular of this slack matrix now non-negative rank only goes down if you go to a sub matrix so if we just throw away these rows of S here what, what's left is our matrix M uh, so the, the inequality goes in the right direction but uh, as we showed on the previous slide the non-negative rank of the matrix M is actually exponentially large right and this concludes the uh, the whole analysis for the correlation polytope we've now shown that if you want to write down some extended form formulation with whatever many additional uh, auxiliary variables uh, if it projects back to the correlation polytope it must have an exponential number of constraints so these nice savings that we saw for for instance the regular n gone and also for things like um, uh, the, the convex hull of all the minimal spanning trees uh, this nice savings does not happen for the correlation polytope correlation polytope you can't really gain very much by adding extra variables right so the extension complexity of this thing is going to be exponentially large um, and what are the consequences for the TSP polytope well as I said before um, once you have a good lower bound for the correlation polytope you can actually derive from that a good lower bound for the TSP polytope es essentially let's say or intuitively by embedding the TSP polytope in the correlation polytope so the word embedding here is, is, is slightly vague so let me just say what I mean um, so let's consider the, the correlation polytope uh, of consisting of, of k by k matrices then I claim that we can somehow embed this into the TSP polytope for a graph with n vertices where n is roughly k squared um, so you remember we had a 2 to the n lower bound for the correlation polytope we will get a 2 to the root n lower bound for the TSP polytope so we lose a square and this is where we lose the square so we're going to a TSP polytope with a number of cities that's actually quadratically bigger than the correlation polytope that, that we know how to how to lower bound and the embedding goes roughly as follows uh, well sorry let me first put a conclusion um, 
since the correlation polytope uh, for k by k matrices has extension complexity exponentially large in k, uh, it follows from this that the TSP polytope has <coughs> extension complexity that's also at least exponentially k, and that means exponentially large in root n, because n is roughly k squared. And how does this embedding go? Well, it goes through, uh, let's say, a bunch of steps, which are all pretty technical. So I'll go, I'll just sort of give a high level view of what, what's happening here. Uh, and these are all gadget based reductions. So what we'll start with is uh, we'll define a specific three set formula that has k squared variables uh, in such a way that the vertices of the correlation polytope of k by k matrices are in one to one correspondence to the satisfying assignments of this formula. Right, remember the vertices of the correlation polytope are k by k, k by k matrices, that's why they have k squared variables, and that's why we need a, a set formula that involves k squared variables. Right, so we somehow define a specific formula in such a way that its satisfying assignments match up to the vertices of the correlation polytope. Then we make a second translation, which is to um, uh, construct a directed graph dn with roughly k squared many vertices, slightly more than that. This again uses some graph gadgets, in such a way that the satisfying assignments of phi are now in one-to-one -one correspondence to the directed tours in dn. Right? Remember, TSP is about undirected tours, uh, but this dn is a directed graph, so we'll have to talk about directed tours. Um, and the last step uh, is to convert this. Actually, this should be dn to convert this, this directed graph dn to an undirected graph gn in such a way that the directed tours in dn are in correspondence to the undirected tours in gn. Um, and what this accomplishes is that we somehow, by going through these different reduction steps, we associate uh, the vertices of the correlation polytope with the undirected tours, so the Hamilton <coughs> Hamiltonian cycles in a specific graph gn. Um, and now how do we prove a lower bound for the TSP polytope? Well, let's consider the face of the TSP polytope that you obtain by putting all of the vertices, all of the edges of Kn to zero that are not in Gn. Right, so Gn is some graph on n vertices, so it's a subgraph of Kn. And what we'll just do is we'll, we'll just uh, put constraints that set all of the non-edges of Gn to zero. And this gives you a face of the TSP polytope, so something that you could obtain from the TS <coughs> TSP polytope by some extra constraints. Um, and it turns out that this is actually an extended formulation of the correlation polytope. So if I had a good extended formulation of the TSP polytope, <coughs> I could obtain from that a good extended formulation of the cor correlation polytope, but we know that the latter doesn't exist. Um, Right, so to sum this up quickly, um, thanks to this reduction, we can somehow take Hi, an extended sorry. formulation. I had one question, if you don't mind. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so in the step two and three, so there's this very standard, I think it's in Kleinberg Tardosh as well, standard reduction of uh, three sat to a directed uh, Hamiltonian problem, which you can, you can then make undirected. I'm just curious, is this basically the standard reduction or does something special? This is basically the standard reduction, that's okay, right. Thanks. But of, of course, uh, what's important for us is that we can somehow argue about, so let's say, that we can reason starting from a extended formulation of the TSP polytope to an extended formulation of the correlation polytope. Because that means that lower bounds for the correlation polytope, which, which is something we already have, translate back to um, 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 lower bounds on the extended extension complexity of the TSP polytope. Um, and this refutes all uh, p versus np proofs, all, 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 let's say, attempts to show that p is equal to np. Uh, not just for, <coughs> for TSP, but also for a bunch of other problems that I won't talk about in detail. But uh, let's say problems like max cuts, um, um, stable set problems, they can all be formulated um, as linear optimization problems over some polytope. And we show that for all of those polytopes that they all have exponential or at least super polynomial extension complexity. So this refutes all these proofs, not just for TSP, but for a host of other combinatorial optimization problems as well. Um, 
Is this going to end all attempts at showing that P is equal to NP? I'm sure not. I'm sure there's people thinking about that right now. So I found this nice cartoon by, by Pavel Putlak. So you can see this mathematician behind his desk. It might be, might be Pavel Putlak himself. He's trying to prove that P is different from NP. Of course, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, and his dog, um, let's say his dog is, is a modern version of Ted Swart because he believes that there's an NP hard problem called the traveling dog problem that he can efficiently solve it. Uh, of course, his solution doesn't fit in the cartoon, but I'm sure there's, there's people like this dog around that, that still attempt to find efficient uh, algorithms of what, whatever type uh, for NP hard problems. And the only thing you can conclude from this talk is that whatever it is that they do, uh, it certainly cannot be, let's say, an efficient extended formulation of the TSP polytope or the cut polytope or, or stable set polytopes. Um, as I said before, this is how, f as, as far as this result goes, we're not proving that all linear programs for traveling salesmen fail, but we prove that a large class of, of linear programs for traveling salesmen fail, where, as I said before, failure means that they have to be exponentially large. Um, so that brings me to the summary of the of the talk, which is good because I seem to be losing my voice. Um, so what did we do here? Well, we studied the extension complexity of polytopes. And uh, extension complexity is sort of a technical word, but what should be in your mind here is the trade-off between extra variables and size. Right? In some cases, by adding a few extra variables, you can very much reduce th the size. And what we did is we showed that unfortunately, well fortunately or unfortunately, this doesn't happen for, for many of the, the polytopes that we care about in combinatorial optimization. So we showed exponential lower bounds on the extension complexity of the correlation polytope. I showed this one explicitly. The cut polytope, because it's essentially isomorphic to the correlation polytope. Uh, we showed it for the stable set polytope, which I didn't show at all in the talk. And we showed it for the TSP polytope. Uh, and this holds both for symmetric and for non-symmetric extensions, thereby solving, finally, this, this old problem that was left open by Yanakakis in his, his 87 work. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting open problems that, um, that, that pop, up, pop up out of this, so let me just mention a few. Um, so, one thing that we do not know how to analyze is the matching polytope. So, you can look at... Um, you can look at the, the complete graph Kn, and you can take the convex hull of all of the perfect matchings in this polytope. Um, so Yanakakis showed that um, symmetric linear programs for this polytope have to be exponentially large. You would expect, actually I don't really know what to expect here, but you might think that <coughs> even non-symmetric um, linear programs uh, require exponential size. Uh, this is something that Yanakak has left open, and it's also something we have to leave open because our techniques fail there. Of course, there's a big qualitative difference here between matching and TSP because we know that there are actually efficient algorithms for matching. Uh, not of the LP form, but uh, let's say of combinatorial form. Um, so this is an, an interesting open question that, uh, that somehow we're not getting any traction on so far. It, it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to what we did here. So Yanakak has had this exponential lower bound for TSP for symmetric LPs. We showed it here for all the LPs. Some th something like that uh, might be true as well for the matching polytope, but we don't know how to prove it. Uh, a second question, which is, which is close to my heart that I've been spending quite a bit of time on without much progress, is to, um, to show lower bounds on positive semi-definite extensions. Um, Right, so linear programs are solvable in polynomial time, and that means that a short linear program for something like TSP means an efficient algorithm. Um, as we all know, you can generalize linear programs by adding semi-definite constraints to them. You get semi-definite uh, programs, and these are still efficiently solvable in polynomial time. So if somebody could come up with uh, an efficient semi-definite extension to the traveling salesman problem, uh, they would still show that P is equal to NP. You know, of course, we don't believe that this uh, should be possible, so it should be, uh, somebody should prove a, some strong lower bound, not just for linear programs for TSP, but even for SDPs for TSP. Um, and this is actually, uh, so we don't know how to prove that, but it is very closely related to a question in, in, in one way, quantum communication complexity. Um, and then the last open problem that I want to mention is, um, it's actually not an open problem that has been studied in subsequent work, 
is to get some lower bounds for approximation. So um, in this talk, uh, we cared about uh, exactly representing the TSP polytope, so writing down linear constraints that give you exactly the same polytope. You could also think about uh, re relaxing the task a little bit, trying to approximate the TSP polytope, so somehow to sandwich it fairly tightly between two low complexity polytopes. Um, Again, this should not be possible, and, and indeed, for, for the specific case of the correlation polytope, there have been two papers that show very tight inapproximability results. So they show that um, approximating the correlation polytope uh, requires a large number of constraints, even if you have extended formulations. So this is a paper by uh, uh, Brown, Fiorini, Pokuta, and Steuerer in, I think, the last Fox, and a paper by Braverman and Moitra, uh, which at least you can find on ECCC. Um, so th this concludes my talk. I have I have two extra slides in case people have <coughs> have some some follow up questions. But uh, let me stop here for now and regain my voice. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you still have the energy, we'll probably switch now to a um, question session. But this this mm -hmm. ends the formal part of the talk. Um, let me just say a few things. Um, so um, those who are currently viewing us, either the Hangout or outside in live uh, live stream, uh, are welcome to stay. Uh, we probably have, if Ola still has energy, we'll probably ask him some questions. Um, during the talk, we had about 30 um, viewers on the webcast. Um, uh, if you want to ask a question, you might be able to join the Hangout later, so hang on. Uh, and post it currently if you have a question and you're viewing it on the webcast, you're viewing us on the webcast, uh, just post a question there. Um, also, I welcome uh, uh, U of Michigan who joined us um, uh, once MIT had to go down due to a fire alarm. Um, <laughs> the talk was uh, exciting for them or not. Um, so welcome, uh, Grant and the group there. Um, so, <laughs> good. So, uh, let's... Well, if you still have some energy, let's let's start, see if there are any questions. Yeah, we have a question. Oh, from there's a question. Uh, Amit. Um, yeah, Amit Chakrabarty is asking on the TCS page if this uh, the connection in the case uh, positive semi-definite to one-way quantum communication complexity. If you wrote this down somewhere, if it's if it's available. Ah, so uh, that's uh, so. First of all, it's in our paper. Second of all, it's on my next slide. So. Let me go to extra slide number one, and that uh, that is to explain this connection between um, between positive semi-definite extensions <coughs> of polytopes and, and communication complexity. Um, uh, this is actually, I think, these, these are very nice connections. That uh, and there's a lot to explore there. Um, so, so this relates back to my second open question: um, Might there be small semi-definite programs for TSP? Um, so uh, let's say to, to, to extend the mathematical framework of Yanakakis to the, the question of semi-definite programs, let me, let me go over, uh, first let's say go over some things that are known for linear programs and then generalize this to semi-definite programs. Um, so just to restate the definition of a non-negative factorization of a matrix S, um, let's say an equivalent way to define it, I defined it differently on an earlier slide, but an equivalent way to define it is um, you can give a non-negative factorization of a matrix S by just giving R-dimensional non-negative vectors AX and BY. X now corresponds, uh, indexes the rows, and Y indexes the columns. Uh, in such a way that for every XY, the inner product between the vectors AX, so the vector corresponding to the Xth row, and the vector BY, so the vector corresponding to the Yth column, that this inner product is actually equal to the matrix entry SXY. Um, and the minimal dimension R in which this is possible, so the minimal dimension R where such vectors exist, um, this is this is the, the non this is the non-negative rank of the matrix S. Um, and what do we have about this non-negative uh, rank? Well, to just repeat what I said before, Yanakakis had this wonderful connection uh, showing that the extension complexity of a polytope is actually equal to the non-negative rank of its like matrix S. Uh, and there's a second very nice connection, which was um, proven by Fienza at all two years ago, and that is that this non-negative rank is actually, you can characterize it by some model of communication complexity. 
Um, and this is a kind of a weird model of communication complexity. So the setup here is um, there's Alice and Bob, as usual. Alice gets input X, Bob gets input Y, as usual. Uh, they communicate back and forth, as usual. Uh, but now Bob is supposed to output some non-negative number Z, and the expected value of Z over the protocol's randomness, that should equal this matrix entry. So if you have such a protocol where the expected value of the output is correct, then I'll say that, <coughs> that that protocol computes the matrix S in expectation, right? And what that really means is Alice gets X, Bob gets Y, and somehow the expected value of the output is the corresponding entry in the matrix. Uh, and the minimal communication complexity that you need for this, uh, the exponential of that, that's actually another way to characterize these things. So the non-negative rank of the matrix S, if you take its logarithm, that gives you exactly the, the minimal number of classical bits of communication that you need for such protocols that compute S in expectation. So there's like, um, one of my co-authors calls this the threefold way. There's some sort of very nice equivalence between three seemingly very different concepts, extension complexity of a polytope, non-negative rank of its slack matrix, and communication complexity, classical communication complexity of the matrix S for protocols that get the expected value right. Um, and the nice thing is that this threefold way, this can be very neatly generalized to the quantum slash SDP case as follows. So let's first generalize the, the definition of non-negative factorization of S to PSD matrices. So the only thing we're going to do to modify the definition is instead of um, asking for non-negative vectors AX and BY in R dimensions, we're going to ask for PSD matrices AX and BY in R by R dimensions. Right, so we will still associate uh, with every row X will associate an object AX, with every column Y will associate an object BY, but now these objects are no longer non-negative vectors, but they're actually positive semi-definite matrices. Um, and the requirement on these matrices is essentially the same as before. Their inner product should be exactly equal to the matrix entry. And in this case, since we're talking about matrices, it's going to be the trace inner product between the two matrices. Um, and the minimal R for which this is possible, this is what we call the PSD rank um, of the matrix S. And now you get, again, an equivalence between three notions, just like what we had in the classical slash LP case, except that now it will be in the quantum slash SDP case. So the equivalence is the following. So the, the PSD extension complexity of a polytope P, and this is essentially the minimal number of constraints that you need if you allow PSD constraints, so not just uh, the usual LP type constraints, but PSD constraints. So the PSD extension complexity is equal to the PSD rank of its slack matrix. It's the same slack matrix, it's, it's, it's just determined by the polytope. It doesn't depend on the difference between LP and SDP. So the PSD rank of its slack matrix actually characterizes um, the size of SDPs that's whose feasible region projects back to the polytope P. So that's equivalence to the first two things that we had before, extension complexity and rank. And we also have an equivalence with communication complexity, but now it's quantum communication complexity. So now you consider protocols where Alice and Bob exchange uh, quantum communication. There's no shared randomness or entanglement here. And again, they have to get, they have to produce an output uh, equaling the matrix value in expectation, right? So what that means is, if we somehow want to lower bound the, um, the uh, SDP extension complexity of, for instance, the correlation polytope, what we need to do is we need to show that any, it's equivalent to showing that any quantum protocol that computes the slack matrix of the correlation polytope in expectation, that this quantum communication protocol needs a lot of communication, presumably linear communication. All right, so what this means is that, that uh, answering my, my second open question, let me just go back, answering my second open question is actually equivalent to proving a lower bound on a certain kind of quantum communication complexity. Uh, unfortunately, it's the type of quantum communication complexity that we don't really know how to analyze because it's this funny model where you don't have to output the correct value with high probability, but you have to just to get the expectation right. Uh, but if somebody would be able to develop good uh, techniques to lower bound quantum communication complexity and expectation, they would be in business because they could try to lower bound the PSD rank of the select matrix of the correlation polytope. Uh, one thing to mention here, it actually turns out that uh, the submatrix M that we used, so remember, let me go back a little bit. 
the submatrix M that we used to lower bound the slack matrix of the correlation polytope, this M here, which had a large uh, non-negative rank, actually has a very small PSD rank. So part of the task is going to be to find some other submatrix of this slack matrix that has high, <coughs> high PSD rank, or equivalently that requires a lot of qubits in com uh, of communication in order to compute it with the right expected values. So I don't know if this answers uh, Amit's question. Um, well, we could have him, uh, Amit, if you're listening, you can actually join in if you wish. Uh, just uh, comment on the page and we'll send you the URL. And that's true for all other viewers. If you want to join in and ask a question, we, we currently have two seats available, so just post a comment and we'll send you the, the URL and you can join us here in the Hangout. Uh, I believe we have one question from MIT, so um, Thomas? Hi. Um, so I have a question. Um, uh, so are there uh, combinatorial problems in combinatorial optimization for which we uh, know are efficiently solvable whose natural polytope do have ex um, efficient extended formulations? Uh, I think finding, uh, finding a small, a minimal spinning tree is an example for that. I see. So if you look at the convex hull of all, all, all spinning trees in, in Kn, this, this is uh, a polytope that has an exponentially large size. However, um, by adding n cubed extra dimensions, you can get its size down to n cubed. Uh, and then you could just uh, find the minimal spanning tree, or at least the size of the minimal spanning tree, by running some linear program solver uh, on this extended formulation of the polytope. Okay, uh, we have one more question. The question is whether the same holds for the matching polytope or not, because we know that there exist efficient algorithms for the matching polytope, but we don't know if we can have an efficient LP for the matching problem based on an efficient extended formulation of the matching polytope. This was the, the first open question that I mentioned. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, so we have actually one more question from NYU. Daniel Dadush. Uh, hi. Um, so I, uh, so in the line of work uh, following this, it seems that the um, non-negative rank lower bounds and the, the lower bounds on approximation and everything have all been based on uh, either unique disjointness or a small perturbation of unique disjointness That's matrix. Right. Um, and uh, it seems that the, the pro I mean, are there any other interesting matrices that, you know, so I think the problem is something like you need to find a matrix that has uh, low rank but high non-negative rank. Um, right. Are there any other matrices that, or problems that seem to have the same characteristic other than unique disjointness? Um, so I think there's an example by Guveya, Parillo, and Reka who showed uh, a matrix that has constant rank, but <coughs> an, an N by N matrix that has constant rank, but uh, logarithmic non-negative rank. So it's a different kind of separation. Right. So we have a separation of, of polynomial versus exponential if you compare rank and non-negative rank. And they have another matrix uh, with a constant versus logarithmic separation. So there are other examples, uh, not that many though. I think it's fair to say that, that uh, all the lower bounds that we know are implicitly, are either explicitly or implicitly based on a disjointness lower bound. Uh, and when I say implicitly, I'm thinking of this recent paper by Braverman and Moitra who use um, um, information complexity results to analyze uh, communication complexity of disjointness and analyze the uh, extension complexity of approximations of the correlation polytope. Um, and somehow they present this as two separate results, none of which implies the other, but the underlying techniques are quite similar. So that's not directly based on the disjointness lower bound, but it's closely related to it. Over. Okay, uh, so we actually have one more question. I'm, I'm trying to see if um, they can join us in from um, Seva Garibian. Um, so since he's not here yet, let me just ask a question. He's trying to join us here in the Hangout. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just read the question. Uh, Seva asked, uh, we've seen that by Anakakis, the extension complexity equals to the positive rank of the slack matrix. I presume this yes. means all slack matrices have the same main positive rank. That's right. You can you can view that as a corollary of Yanakakis' res results, but you can also see it in an easier way because um, 
So adding redundant redundant inequalities uh, to your slack matrix is not going to change the non-negative rank. So the non-negative rank is just a number of facets of the uh, of the uh, of the polytope. Of course, okay, you can increase the number of rows in your right. matrix, but it's not going to change the non-negative rank. So I think he's still trying to join us, but um, mm -hmm. he might have further questions on that. Um, so it seems like there are currently no more questions. I, I do have one more extra slide that I could show if people are interested. So let me just pull it up and, and remind me what it says again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, shall I just explain this slide? This might be interesting. Um, I think, yeah, I think I'd like to see that. I'm just trying to see if uh, Sevag is able to mm -hmm. join us. Probably not. I think he has some um, trouble. Um, okay, so in the meantime, I'll be happy to hear about the second slide. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right, so so if, if you look at the title of, of the stock paper, then it, it says something like um, uh, linear versus semi-definite um, extensions, um, strong lower bounds. And, and an equivalent way to say that is that um, one of the things we did is we, we showed um, an exponential separation between non-negative rank of a matrix and the PSD rank of a matrix. So uh, part of this this slide is just rehashing what what uh, what I already mentioned in the talk itself, but let me just uh, just say it anyway. So recall uh, the matrix that we had before, 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. Uh, for some reason, I'm now using x and y to, to uh, index rows and columns, but it's the same matrix. So we showed that this matrix has large um, uh, non-negative rank. But you can actually show, and this is easy to show, that it has very low PSD rank. And um, this actually proves what I mentioned before. Uh, if we want to prove lower bounds for semi-definite programs for the correlation polytope, uh, this matrix is not the one to use. So we'll have to look for a different sub-matrix of the select matrix of the correlation polytope, because this guy actually has a very low PSD rank. Um, and the easiest way to see that is to just give a factorization. So let's say that we define the matrix AX to be the following rank 1 matrix. Um, you take the n plus 1 dimensional vector x comma 1, so that's the n different entries of x, that's n dimensions comma 1. You take the outer product of that vector with itself, so that gives you a rank 1 PSD matrix AX. Uh, for BY you do essentially the same, <coughs> the same thing for Bob's input Y, but now with a minus 1 in the uh, n plus first uh, uh, coordinate, you take the outer product of this thing with itself. Uh, and now it's easy to see that if you take the trace inner product between this AX and this BY, you get exactly the matrix entry. You get exactly the square of 1 minus X inner product Y. Um, and why is this interesting? Well, this is actually a very low rank um, factorization. We only needed rank N plus 1 for this. Right, so what we gave here is um, uh, is an exponential separation between uh, non-negative rank and PSD rank. This was actually an interesting open question in itself. Uh, I think independently from us, around the same time, uh, another separation was found by uh, Troy Lee and Sheng Yu Zhang. Um, and there's something that I also want to mention, which is um, if people are interested in the log rank conjecture, this is one of the main open problems in, uh, in, in classical communication complexity. So our work shows that this, this question is actually equivalent to a simulation question uh, in communication complexity. So what we show, and this is an easy consequence of some of our results, is that the log rank conjecture is true um, if and only if um, every quantum communication protocol that computes a Boolean matrix in expectation can be efficiently simulated by a classical protocol. Uh, in other words, they're, they're, the log rank conjecture is true if and only if there are no big gaps in quantum and classical communication complexity and expectation for Boolean matrices. And the Boolean is important here because for this non-Boolean matrix M here, above here, we already showed that there is an exponential separation. So if you can show that there is no exponential separation um, for Boolean matrices, you actually prove the log rank conjecture. I mean, if you give it a really an efficient uh, simulation. Uh, I don't know if this is going to help the log rank conjecture to solve the log rank conjecture at all, but it's a very different perspective on it, right? Instead of phrasing it as just a combinatorial question or a question about classical protocols, you can also phrase it equivalently as a question about whether classical protocols can efficiently simulate certain quantum protocols. Um, and this really exhausts uh, even the extra material, so over to you again. Okay, um, so Sif just joined us. Uh, I mm -hmm. 
Hi, Seth. And I guess you don't have any more questions. So thanks everyone for uh, being with us. Thank you very much, Ronald, for uh, being patient with all the technical glitches we had in the, during the test two days ago. Um, You're very welcome. And <laughs> we hope to see you all here in uh, two weeks. We'll send an announcement. And let me just remind everyone that uh, you should follow the TCS Plus page. Um, this is the new page we uh, just uh, set up two days ago. It has the new icon. Uh, we'll keep using the old page for a while, but due to some technical issues, we had to move to a new page. Um, so um, you should also follow the, the new page. It has a slightly nicer icon. Uh, OK, so that's it. We'll probably um, shut off now, unless someone has anything else to ask. Um, OK, so see you all in two weeks. Bye-bye. Great. See you all.